I took the opportunity to change the title of my talk slightly to Computation, the Greatest Unsolved Problem of Our Lifetime. Some people tend to think it's climate change or cancer, but what can you believe it? It's computation. And uh, while I say that a little bit in jest, when you talk to people about computing and computation, they tend to think that all the problems are solved. And what I'd like to um, talk to you a little bit about today is the fact that, no, there are, quite, there are some fundamental problems in computing and computer science that are not yet solved. So the challenge today was to talk about, you know, if Trevor Pearcey was alive today, what would he be working on? So at the time that Trevor and his team built SIRAC, our understanding of computation was relatively mature, I would say. And since then, we've made a lot of progress. And in particular, there's this one problem here. It's called this P versus MP problem, but I wouldn't really worry too much about the name of it. It's listed as one of the seven problems at the Clay Mathematics Institute at Cambridge, Massachusetts. And this, simply put, the problem can be stated as, if it is easy to check that a solution to a problem is correct, is it easy to solve the problem? This problem was formulated in 1971. There's a million dollar prize for, from the Clay Institute to solve this problem. And you might want to go home tonight and uh, think about it. Hopefully what I'm going to give you here is a few hints as to, as to what you should be looking at. OK, so the point, there are two points I'm going to try and make. The first is that there's a science to computer science, and our understanding of computation, even today, is still limited. And secondly, you know, while the theory of computer science tells us that some problems are difficult or impossible to solve, why is it that we see a lot of remarkable things going on right now, particularly in artificial intelligence, which, like Liz and myself, is, uh, is our area of research? All right, so let me try and start from the beginning here. There's a lot of talk about algorithms nowadays. Everyone's inventing algorithms. I thought they were all invented. When I, when I was an undergrad, I thought they'd already been all invented. But let me just talk to you a little bit about the difference between an algorithm and a program. So an algorithm is essentially a recipe. Um, here's a set of recipe books. And if you take some ingredients and you follow one of those recipes, what you'll end up is something like this. What the computer will act for, the solution to your problem. So a program's just a recipe that you can um, execute on a computer. All right, so that's so easy. So what's all the fuss about? Well, there are some resources involved. So one is time, how long it's going to take you, take, how long it's going to take you to solve a problem. And the other one usually is how much memory do you have to store um, the computation as you go. Some problems are easy to solve. That's good. Um, when I'm teaching this to my undergraduate students, I then ask them, well, some problems are difficult to solve, and is that good or bad? And they're usually sitting, that's bad. And I say to them, okay, what gives you the confidence to type your credit card details on the internet and buy something? And then I think about it a bit, and they go, oh, yeah, because the encryption problem is easy, but the decryption problem is hard. And so we rely on the fact that certain problems are difficult to solve. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing commerce on the internet. And this is the thing that really blew me away because I started my life as an undergraduate in mechanical engineering. And when I had to do a computer science class in my first year and I was reading a textbook during my holidays, the only textbook I think I read from cover to cover, um, it started talking about problems that were impossible to solve on a machine. Again, what are you talking about? Surely the machine can solve any sorts of problems. Just a little bit about computation. This is the way a computer scientist views the world. And... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I'm not lying to you. So when, when a computer scientist faces a problem, the first thing that they're trying to figure out is how difficult is this problem? And we believe that the levels of difficulty are in a sort of hierarchy. You start off with sort of easy problems down here, and then they get harder and harder and harder. Now, you don't really need to worry about the labels. Um, the idea is really that they're just um, problems that increase in difficulty. Now, just to put this in a little bit of perspective, my area is what's called knowledge representation and reasoning. How do you represent knowledge on a machine? And then how do you reason with that knowledge? So I'm going to purely put this in the forms of, um, of some uh, tasks that you might say require intelligence. So your, your basic sort of deductive reasoning for a basic type of logic is at this level, this NP level. Um, problems in this level tend to um, increase exponentially. So this little graph here just says this is the time it's going to take to solve one of these problems, and this is the size of the problem. Now, to maybe use a different example, what a problem in this class would be typical logistical problems. So if you've got a certain number of trucks, a certain number of planes, a certain number of packages, and so on, every truck package or whatever that you add to this problem, the time is going to double. And as you can see, the time increases really, really quickly. But that's really at the bottom of this hierarchy. 
There are problems like planning. So if you have a set of actions that a robot can perform and you want it to start in a particular situation and end up in another situation, what actions does it need to perform? That's the planning problem and it's at a high level of difficulty. There's another problem called the behaviour composition problem. Again, I won't go into the nature of the problem, but the point is that these problems get harder and harder and harder. And then there are problems that can't be solved. So d deductive reasoning in much more expressive logic than this basic one is a problem that can't be solved. So hang on, this is a task that we would associate with intelligence, but it's a task that you can't solve on a machine. So how are we doing all this fancy stuff nowadays? Well, the analogy that I tend to use is this beehive. So we tend to think of bees as a really organised uh, uh, society and uh, the things work really effectively and efficiently. But if you look at all these bees, you'll see that yeah, it's a little bit chaotic. You know, at one point you'll see two bees hit one another. The reason I use this analogy is I remember when I was in science class at high school and I thought that these, see there, that two bees hit one another. And I thought bees were really effective communities. And then when I saw this high speed video of the bee hive, I thought, oh, wow, they're not. It's not. And the, and the analogy for humans is that if you think about how humans reason, humans are not precise reasoners. Uh, and, we, and yet we effectively you know, operate in our brain. So how do we do that? Well, that's because when we look at the hierarchy, we're talking about the worst possible case. So we're trying to figure out optimal solutions to problems. And as soon as you start getting away this notion of wanting to come up with the best possible solution, sometimes things become a lot easier. And that's essentially what happens in, in a lot of artificial intelligence. So just to give you a, a, another example here, this is a, an assignment that I used to give my students in their first year class. So one day I was trying to find inspiration for a, a, an assignment problem, so I went to the local game store and I started looking through all the games that they had. Not computer games, by the way, these are just card games, board games and so on. And I found this game, I've modified the rules slightly, but it's based on this Crown and Andrews game called Make Five. So essentially, there are a number of players, everyone gets a five by five group, and then there's a deck of cards. And as you lift the cards, each card has a letter with a digit score on the bottom. That, that's the basic rules I'm going to use. There are some cards in this game that actually have two letters or, or so on, but you know, let's just keep to this simple version of this game. So as each card is drawn, each player puts that letter in one of the five 25 squares on that grid and at the end they start trying to make three, four or five letter words and they tally the scores, just summing up the digits associated with each letter and the player with the highest score wins. So I spent a lot of time at home trying to think, come up with a fancy animation and this is what I started with. So I would give this assignment to students and I would give them the cards and they would say, okay, put this card in row one, column one, two, and so on. Then I would, at the very end, when they were able to sort of just get you to interactively play this game. Uh, and then someone said, okay, now you've got a minute on the CPU to rearrange the cards and try and maximize the score. And I'd run this every night and show them when they're up on the leaderboard so they're very competitive and play it and so on. Now to put this in perspective, like if you have to do this brute force and look at every possible permutation, on my Mac, which is a couple of years old now, but on my Mac, I calculated that it would take it 12 to 13 years to look at every possible permutation and score those permutations, right? So here, this is the output of my little program. So these are the cards in the squares with the digit scores. If you're trying to make words out of this, this, this was started by just randomly placing the cards in the, in the 25 squares, right? So I started off randomly placing them down. The program did it for me. And uh, in this particular permit, th this particular layer, there's only one word that it comes up with, chore. A little pinnacle looked up in the dictionary, a little pinnacle of rocks. It's the only word that it comes up with, and it's a score of 13. So that's just randomly putting the cards down. <clears throat> and just remember that you, you're just seeing them one by one, and you have to place them at that time. Okay, so then it's interesting sort of what strategies you can use that come up with really good solutions here. So here's the strategy that we're going to use. We're going to randomly pick two of the cards, and we're going to swap them. And if they improve the score, we'll keep it, and otherwise we'll swap them back. And uh, let's see how well that does. Okay, so here is the grid that it came up with after a minute. And you, look, you can start seeing words here. You've got ashes, so ash would be another word in there. You've got hills at the bottom here. You've got broil. So how well did it do? Well, it scored 286. There were three, uh, sorry, there were 11 three-letter words, nine four-letter words, and four five-letter words. While I was at home last night, I thought, oh, let, let me try and prepare for this talk. So I read 20 of them. And uh, this is the list that it came up with. So the first one was that one, and I was pretty lucky because I ended up with 286. You see that I didn't get to 286, although I did get, when I tried it the 20th time, it came up with 289. 
You start here, this is just randomly placing the cards down, and in a minute you can get to, to, to this sort of score. So this is, these are not guaranteed to be optimal outcomes, but they are pretty good outcomes. And I've only used a minute, I haven't used my 12 years to figure out what the best solution is. All right, so that's sort of the basis of my talk. Now I'm just gonna talk about some of the stuff I've done because um, I wanted to show some videos, but I also wanna illustrate some of the basic ideas here. So at UNSW, there were some people in the art and design faculty that had the foresight to build what I think follows in, in PSU's footsteps of some really innovative technology. So this is a cylindrical projection area, which is 10 metres in diameter, three and a half metres high, you said in the middle, and you're fully sort of surrounded. So they asked me whether I was interested in um, making a movie, so we made a movie for that, uh, that high year, the, uh, the premiere, sorry, the film festival in 2011. And the challenging thing here was actually to come up with a theatrical piece rather than a game that you're playing against a computer. So in this piece here, there are five audience members and there's a tracking system that tracks them. And so there are certain, there are, you can sort of vaguely make it, it's a black and white film as you can see, but there are these little eyeballs and the eyeballs soon will have some virtual characters that sit on them. And you as the humans, as you move around, those characters will follow you. And as the movie sort of progresses, there's a point at which there are human characters and there are virtual characters that are controlled by a little artificial intelligence program that she and I wrote. And, it's, and the audience members have to figure out what they um, what they have to do. I actually want to see the, the film. It takes about 10-15 minutes. This next piece, I might have to, I'm not sure, I might have to mute the sound at one point because it's a... Uh, Okay, so sorry, so this colleague of mine from mechanical engineering says, oh, look, I want to dismantle these um, LCD screens for um, recycling. And he says, I've got a ton of these monitors. You're going to use some machine learning to learn how to dismantle these monitors. And I said, no way. You're going to have to dismantle a ton of these monitors to get this done. And there's toxic chemicals in here, so you won't be able to do it. So what we came up with is a system that um, learns by demonstration. So it starts off with a basic program, and um, they're here, you can just see it, it's just got a cutting wheel. It's a new version of this with a new PhD student that has a screwdriver and so on. But this one just had a cutting wheel. And um, <clears throat> what it does is it starts dismantling the screen, and when it comes up with a model, and at a point in dismantling that model that it can't proceed, it calls the operator and says, okay, I'm stuck here, what should I do? And the operator says, well, in this case, you should have performed this action instead of that action. And it modifies the program, and then it, it rumours that when it sees the monitors again over again. So again, this is just illustrating the point that we're not going to be looking for optimal solutions for this problem. We're going to get human help in trying to figure out what this program looks like. Because now here's my favourite one, which is our um, uh, robot soccer team. So these are fully autonomous robots about so high. I was going to bring one with me, but they're a little bit heavy to carry around. And when we were on the front of the page of the newspaper, it was Australia beats Germany in the World Cup. And then if you read the print, it was in robot soccer. So this is, I'll just show you two matches and... Uh... So just remember, these are fully autonomous robots. So these robots have a camera, they've got two eyes, but the eyes don't actually see anything. There's a camera in the forehead, a camera in the chin, and um, they've got uh, four um, uh, uh, sonars essentially in the chest, which tell you whether there's something standing in front of you, pressure sensors on the feet. But essentially they're only using these two cameras to figure out where they are on this field. And it's remarkable how those two cameras, if I'm looking around the robot, will say, I'm here on the field, I can see an opponent here and an opponent there. They can talk to one another, one another over the wireless network, so they can try and figure out you know, where all the opponents are, and they will play this game. And they, they'll play it that well, and so much so that I'm gonna show you another video. <laughs> this, was from the, this was from the year that we won the, the championship.
so again, to solve these problems, the, the robot does not sit there and analyze every pixel in that screen. It's a quite interesting the techniques that it used to just sample parts of those images and figure out what's going on. So again, you, you can do incredible things when you, and you don't necessarily need to, you know, reason optimally or, or try and come up with optimal solutions. And um, hopefully that's what Trevor Pearcy would be doing today if he was <laughs> This last bit, which was where I was going to say, is this the future? <laughs> oh, and this is a robot that people can, that interacts with people. But that's essentially what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Yeah.